So, guys, we finally made it to blend mode. As always, let's discuss this topic briefly and clearly. Blend mode refers to blending modes. How this material should blend with its environment. We're starting our journey. The opaque mode is the most common default mode used in most materials. In Unreal, yes, here we see examples. These could be metal, ceramic. What unites them is that they are completely opaque. This means that if I come close to someone and look at them, I can't see anything behind them. We've talked about the Z buffer, and we understand that to begin with, Unreal performs calculations. It wants to determine which objects are visible and which are not. If some objects are not visible, it doesn't try to render them, display them, or process them further. In other words, it doesn't waste resources on them. That's why this mode is the most efficient. To understand how heavy a material is, you can go into the lit mode. In the optimized view mode's shader set, if it's green, it means they're performing very well. If it's like this, or this here, or if it's white, those are considered very expensive. It's better not to use them, or to use them only rarely, and only as specifically intended. As for everything related to opaque, those are simply materials that are completely non-transparent, meaning you cannot see through them at all, that's all. Then we have masking. They differ from opaque materials in that they have an additional option to mask a certain area, and here you need to understand the following important point. Either we can completely mask a certain area, or fully reveal it, or fully hide it, there is no intermediate value. We can't say, be half transparent, or anything like that. So here, in this example, we see that the grid is fully visible, and the areas between the cells are completely invisible, with no partial transparency at all. This means that every part is either entirely shown or entirely hidden, with nothing in between. But a it's either yes or no, and there are other examples. Explore them, take a look, and enjoy. I don't really know exactly what's coming up next, but at this point we have translucency. And here, as you can see, it's already a bit different. Again, we're coming back to the concept of the Z buffer. When Andre realizes he doesn't actually need to render, or even worry about objects that aren't visible to the viewer, everything suddenly becomes much easier and more straightforward. We saw the green image, and we like it, but when we have a semi-transparent object, and you can actually see some other objects through it, Unreal can't simply say these objects need to be hidden. That's why Translucent actually handles the Z-buffer just a bit differently than usual. It needs to be clearly understood, which means it definitely has to be displayed on screen, but with some additional correction applied. In this case, if we look at this glass, we can see that there's a fake sky here. It's been overlaid, and then we have distortions. We have additional options. Let's talk about that a bit later. Let's move on to the water and take a look. Here we have ripples, the water's tint, a bluish overlay as well, and these waves, and so on. So we can already see the scene behind this effect. Let's open this glass material. By default, when we switch to insulin, the PBR information will be disabled. We remember what PBR is. It's a method for the Andrev engine to transmit physically accurate and highly detailed material data. Of course, Glass can have this information available, but by default, it's turned off for performance reasons. Here, in the Light Mode tab, that is the Lighting Mode section, we can switch it to Surface. Forward shading, or some kind of translucent volume, depending on the specific requirements of your project or scene. I think it works either way. Alright, now the PBR options become available to us. So as we mentioned, PBR is this method. How Unreal processes incoming light, in other words, how it should process the light. All right, if there is absolutely no light, then there's nothing to process. Then we see that it's completely specular, we see that it's 70% metallic, we see that it's here, we have it. We have roughness, some kind of pattern, some spots, they're barely visible, but they are there. Trust me, on the surface of the table we have noticeable reflection and refraction, and so on, some visual distortions. That's precisely what I called, in very simple terms. If you vividly remember, I called it irregularities. There are also subtle irregularities present on the glass itself, even though you probably can't easily perceive them with the naked eye. That's all. As for the translucent shader, remember that it's expensive. Use it only when necessary. And yes, even if we simply apply the translucent shader, just switch over to that mode. But set its transparency to full, meaning we set it to 1, and then look at it, now we can't see anything behind it. But it will still be there, and it will still be expensive. Now let's move on and take a look. 
on this. It's still expensive. And why is that? Because the moment we switch the mode to translucent, it means that Unreal, by default, prepares, handles, and processes the entire material in a slightly different way. Yeah. That is, it works in a more complex way, according to different rules, different principles, different algorithms, simply put, and correctly so. It's good with you, so I'll revert this for now. So please don't use this too often, don't overuse it, and definitely don't stack them one after another. That is, glass after glass after glass and so on. Doing that would be a real nightmare for it. In other words, moderation is really important here. It would have a stroke. I promise you, wait, what is that stuck there? Then, after translucent material, we have what is called additive material, but basically it is essentially the same as translucent. Additive, it would seem, but additive material is generally for bright objects. In APA, they're mainly used. They are semi-transparent, of course, but they're mostly used for VFX effects. When we need things like bright sparks, particles, beams, lasers, lightning, that is, there are always some kind of light effects involved. But we're not saying that they're used 100% of the time. We're saying that they're mostly used. Because if we mean something like smoke or fire that doesn't glow, kind of, you understand, of course, that you should primarily and mainly use the transfer itself if your game is truly meant to convey something profoundly positive, such as genuine kindness and so on. If it's light and bright, then definitely use additive. If you have something like the critically acclaimed Souls series or something quite similar in tone and atmosphere, then absolutely focus on Transfer Santo. But that's just from my own personal experience. In principle, you can certainly mix both this and that and thereby get these kinds of interesting and varied results. Next, we have Modulate. So Modulate is also semi-transparent. But in reality, that's an illusion. Don't believe it. Because what Modulate does is it takes the image behind it, that is, the entire scene that you see behind this rectangle, and multiplies it by its own color. In this particular case, it's this light blue color. The whole scene, everything visible, is multiplied by this specific light blue color. If we set it here, just give me a second, to white, pure white, you'll notice the effect changes. I want it all. Then nothing changes, we just change the color to blue, and it gets tinted accordingly. Of course, we can also darken it by choosing a darker color shade. Like in this case, where I picked a dark red. We can set it to black, and then it won't be visible at all. Darken it, lighten it. But you can't lighten it, of course. Just change the shade or darken it. And of course, just like in the first video when I talked to you about the light function material, do you remember? There was a distinct funnel-like effect for the spotlight, meaning for the light source, it was rotating in a circular motion, and there were all sorts of effects. We looked at that together, and of course, it was very interesting. Whether such features are necessary or not, whether they're logical or not, it really doesn't matter. If you need it, you do it. If you don't need it, you don't do it. In my case, I'm not too focused on physically accurate rendering, because I create stylized works. For me, it's not crucial what gets connected, where, or how physically accurate everything is, so I don't worry about that. If you're making something realistic, then go ahead. But if you want to get started, I recommend starting with stylization. So I suggest, well, of course, do as you like. And so, basically, we've launched, I don't know, some kind of drifting smoke, some kind of visual effect. Maybe it's green fire, maybe it's poisonous vapor, or... I don't know, just give it a name or come up with something. Write in the comments what you think it is. Next, we have Alpha Composite, and to put it simply, it's basically the same as a translation, to put it as simply as possible. The only thing that sets them apart is this part, just a moment. Andreas, when he finishes all this logic, the shawarma we've prepared here. Once we're done with it, we're already getting ready to connect it to the base color. Here's the final point. The translation takes our finished result and multiplies it by the transparency, by the opacity. Then it connects it, meaning it outputs the image already multiplied by the opacity as the result. If we do it this way, we'll see that translucent and alpha composite are no different from each other. So that's the only thing that sets them apart. Now, for the curious, here's some additional information. If someone has imported PNG textures and tried to use decal or just PNG images imported into Unreal, 
they might have run into some issues, like their image having white borders. This happens because, in fact, this particular technique was originally created and specifically designed to solve this problem. So, what does Alpha Composite do? It takes the color of the texture, that is, the texture itself, and multiplies it by the texture itself. It's already done. The color is multiplied. Preliminarily, it's multiplied by the alpha channel, so it's a ready-made texture that you can use. This helps to avoid those errors, visual artifacts, and also helps to display PBR information in a much more detailed and realistic way. What exactly is PBR, you might ask? We've talked about this before. So, simply put, a texture whose information, that is, whose color, has been pre-multiplied by alpha is physically more accurate than when the alpha is separated into its own channel. And that's it, the last ones. These are my favorites. Of course, that was sarcasm. It was a complete disappointment. Now I don't even want to dwell on it. So I'll just go over it briefly. If you need it, just know that maybe you'll find a use for it. It's just that I spent a long time trying to find a solution, but I couldn't find a good one. Moving on. Next, we have Alpha Holdout. This is a material that is applied to a surface. In this case, to ours. So I applied my material to it. And for the material, I assigned a texture. And I specify that I want to cut an opening based on this texture. In this plane, it works. You might think, cool, now we're going to create all sorts of things. I thought so too. Well, it's not all that pleasant though. Why is that, you might ask? Well, let's take a closer look at this particular scenario together. For this method to work properly, it's absolutely necessary and essential that the material you want to cut out is set to translucent. And we remember that using translucent is expensive in terms of performance, even if it's set to full opacity. So keep that in mind as we move forward. So just switching it to translucent already means that this material will be costly. That's the first thing. Secondly, I connected it. Let me clear out all this information here. Then I say, well, of course, this is my cube, and some really strange things are actually happening here, right? I want it to be double-sided, so I try to make it double-sided so that there are walls inside as well. And, well, actually, that's not a mistake at all, not in the slightest. The thing is, all these modes have their own algorithms and calculations. That is, when we switch, Unreal understands the material, understands that it needs to calculate this material differently using a different algorithm. When we switch to translucent and set it to two-sided, it brings up the important question, how should it even display the second side since the object is semi-transparent? That's why these artifacts appear. Even if we try to somehow suppress them, this is the simplest way. I've tried all sorts of things. Believe me, nothing will work for us. That's the first thing. Secondly, even if we were to take this particular wall and carefully place one, two, three of them, just like this, these specific kinds of planes, if we observe closely, what actually happens is that our mask, the alpha channel, the hollowed out section, it precisely cuts out distinct openings and intricate patterns. This occurs all over the entire world, basically, as long as we have these substantial walls standing firmly in place, right? That is to say, any objects positioned behind it that are semi-transparent will continue to endlessly render and be processed until the system goes completely through all of them. It only stops when it encounters an opaque object. So if our wall is opaque, it sees the wall, and then any object behind it is no longer processed. All right, that's also a major drawback. Then the question arises, how can we actually use this? In this case, I combined these planes together, then separated them into four individual planes and assigned a standard material to each one. I also mentioned that this property is called opacity, which means the material is transparent or see-through. After that, I made the front part transparent as well and added a mask to further control the visibility of the object. So this setup works quite well now if you need something for a specific situation, as it might come in handy somewhere. If someone has already built something like this for you, and that's all you need, especially if you are working on stylized projects, then this approach can be very useful for your needs. Some games where you don't have ready-made ones, textures, all these materials are ready, and you kind of... your shaders are mostly made up of colors, and so on, then this is a great solution for you if you find a use for it. There were places where it could be applied. 
But again, as I said, it only works for translucency, and that's a big problem. And again, some additional information. Why? Once again, we talked about buffers, about passes. The passes that Unreal makes in order to render a frame for us. Initially, of course, the most efficient and fastest option is the geometry buffer. When our object is completely opaque, it does not need to process the information that is behind it in this context. That is, the objects that are behind it. However, if the object is semi-transparent, that's a different story. This needs to be deferred until after all the objects have been rendered. Then it has to take the semi-transparent object and process it. And somehow combine or blend it with the iPhone behind it. That's why, as you can more clearly understand, alpha holdout works. That is, it is rendered in the translucent path buffer, just like translucent. This means that both translucent and alpha holdout are processed together in the same buffer. They are, so to speak, in one group, while masked and opaque are in another group. Since they're in different groups, we can't cut out the wall, for example, and open it. That's exactly what happens with this wall. We live like this, and honestly, I don't really know exactly where you might need this, but I've given you the information here for your reference. All of this is of course quite interesting, but in actual practice you'll mostly use masked, translucent, and, if you create some effects, probably additive as well. So, while there are other possibilities, these are the main ones you'll encounter and work with most frequently. And if not, then just these first three, alright? All the rest are more situational, but if you need them, use them. If you don't need them, don't use them. That's all regarding blend mode. If I forgot something, I'll remind you, all the links are in the description. Again, please leave your comments.